Hello and welcome to the Flucoma podcast. Today I'm talking with John Bowers, who is an artist researcher whose work has been seen and heard all over the world, from international festivals to touring theatre to exhibitions at MoMA New York. In his creative work, he spends much of his time improvising with modular synths, DIY electronics and self-made software. He also has many musical collaborations, notably with his noise drone band Tone Sucker and his improvising trio 3BP, Three Body Problem, uh, with Adam Peltz Melby and Paul Stapleton. Today, we shall be more uh, learning more about this creative work and the various ways in which uh, he has used some of the Flucoma tools in his practice. So, John, hello, and thank you for talking with me today. Hello there. Um, so perhaps you could begin by explaining how you got into the field of experimental music. Well, uh, now I'm an old guy, you see, as you can probably tell from the long white beard. <laughs> and that means that uh, I can tell a very long story and, um, uh, and, and incorporate lots of interesting personal history and cultural references. But of course, the trouble with being an old guy is you might have lots of stories to tell, but nobody really cares. Uh, so let me try and steer a, uh, a path between those two extremes of excessive detail and, uh, you know, uh, uh, elderly flippancy. Um, uh, I mean, it's interesting, my encounters with, with music, with technology, with um, forms of different forms of culture, uh, it's a very wavy path, a very wavy path. And part of that does relate to uh, my age uh, the, and my cultural history, my personal cultural history. Um, so I was brought up in Ipswich in Suffolk, uh, which uh, in the 1960s was, uh, well, I'm not exactly going to call it a cultural wasteland, but, uh, but it, was, uh, it was passed up for the University of East Anglia. The University of East Anglia was to be sited in Ipswich, but uh, in the end, uh, I think the local council decided that they'd rather have, it to have a speedway stadium on the site uh, rather than a, a university, and they're probably quite right. Um, so, so it's a very strange, it's a kind of strange place, uh, Ipswich. It's, uh, it's a place that a lot of people leave. A lot of people leave to go to London, which is just um, 70 miles, 100 kilometers away, uh, or to university and don't really come back. And, um, it, and uh, gradually, I suppose, certainly during the 70s, uh, and it developed, uh, uh, late 70s, it developed a very active punk and DIY culture. And there are a number of venues and, uh, and, and places where things were happening. And uh, actually, in the early 80s, I... I promoted at one as well and promoted lots of experimental uh, stuff by myself, colleagues and so on. It's quite an interesting and lively scene. Uh, but in many ways, uh, I think in these kinds of places, provincial places in the time I'm talking about, you would find out about things very serendipitously. You'd um, uh, Radio and TV were quite possibly more informative then than they are now. Uh, so, you know, you could pick up, uh, so I, I first, I first saw a documentary about Stockhausen, uh, on the TV and I thought, ah, now this could be interesting. And, uh, and, and a lot of experimental art, uh, uh, Stuart Brisley's performance art, for example, I first encountered, uh, on a live television broadcast where he emerged from a swamp of bloody offal and walked towards the camera on live TV. And uh, I, and you know, this these kinds of serendipitous and strange encounters um, uh, through radio, TV, um, occasional uh, 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 occasional disc jockeys who are playing stuff. Obviously, John Peel and others who are playing stuff which touched on a little bit of of uh, uh, experimental things. Uh, but actually, myself and a lot of other people who come from this town. Uh, uh, and there are a number of, uh, you know, uh, reasonably well-known musicians who have come from Ipswich. Uh, extreme noise terror, for example. Uh, 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 but we cradle of filth. Uh, anyway, um, but a lot of us uh, of more my generation, uh, we, we found we have a common sort of set of reference points uh, in the local record life. So the things that, that whoever was buying records for the Ipswich Borough Record Library, I thank you. 
because it's through then that myself and others were introduced to, uh, for example, um, a Messiaen. Uh, I mentioned Stockhausen, but also um, free jazz. Um, uh, uh, I particularly encountered Henry Cow. Uh, and of course, when you encounter Henry Cow as a teenage boy, you're going to have one up on the playground versus all of your mates. You know, they, they think, you know, yes is, uh, you know, extreme, but, you know, Henry Cow. Um, record shop randomness. Um, so I encountered Can and a lot of uh, what we call Krautrock, uh, Cosmische Music, again, through the, the things that the local record shop just happened to have in. Um, a very influential sort of album for me as a, as a teenager was uh, were, were Fred Frith's guitar solos records, um, which really introduced me to certain forms of, uh, of improvisation. Uh, and on one of those guitar solos albums, there's uh, Derek Bailey uh, and Hans Reichel, as well as Fred Frith. And, uh, and Hans Reichel, of course, this introduced me to the idea that one could build one's own instruments and one could experiment uh, and put variation into, you know, something even as familiar as the electric guitar and do do quite, quite different things with it. And and again, and Bailey's uh, Bailey's technique, you know, that this was possible on uh you know on an elect on a guitar uh an electric and acoustic guitar uh this this really really impressed me um and i suppose i saw i started becoming interested in uh you know as as a kind of largely self-taught uh person i became interested in uh improvisation uh and electronics uh uh through this sort of rather wavy path however I mean, when I went to university, I studied psychology and philosophy. I didn't study music. I didn't have, I didn't have any kind of formal training. So uh, I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to do that, uh, at all, uh, at that sort of time. And, and, and after studying psychology and philosophy as an undergraduate, I, I, I launched into an academic career and, uh, which has been with me ever since, but it's one where, where involvement with music, um, has been alongside other things uh so psychology social sciences computer science during the 90s i did a lot of ethnographic studies of work and technology so sort of field research work, look, looking at people working using sort of anthropological or, or traditional anthropological methods looking at people working with technology and um and it was only really, I suppose, in around 2000 when I decided as a, as a mature student to uh, um, go to the University of East Anglia and study with Simon Waters um, uh, uh, that uh, I, I kind of you know, tried to converge uh, the interests that I'd always had uh, with uh, uh, what was more my sort of academic uh, day job work. But that still took several years to 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 really bring together and very important for me also was like for about 10 years i worked in sweden uh at the royal institute of technology kungliga technical hergskolen in sweden and there i became quite closely acquainted with the with phil kingen uh, ems the electroacoustic music scene around stockholm and i began playing with people there and performing and and I had a residency at Filkingham something like 10, 15 years, 15 years ago now. And, um, and that, uh, 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 and that really sort of, uh, that sort of formed me. And there was a, a, a very important and long term collaboration I've had with, uh, Stenol of Hellstrom, uh, as a duo, uh, working, um, in vaguely, you know, electroacoustic improvisation of, of, of various sorts. So I think it's uh, sorry. This is a long story, um, but it's kind of it's kind of interesting. I mean, there's certainly obviously certain people. There are certain paths which are open to people to to you know access the you know cultural and academic areas we're in, which are available now, uh, and their like were not available when I was uh, you know a youngster. Uh, uh, ways into studying music, um, other than a kind of conservatoire path or a conservatoire related path, uh, and ways of engaging with, uh, technology, um, and information about things quite independently of, uh, of institutions. 
uh um and that i think is uh is uh is interesting so there are specific things i think there about about my wavy background which bring me to be the mess that i am these days yeah well it's it's um it's funny it's quite a similar kind of uh beginning into life as as the previous guest on the podcast uh Tomomi Adachi. Uh, who didn't have any kind of formal music training. Uh, he he studied philosophy at university, and uh, yeah, very much into the to the punk scene, hacking, uh, instrument making, and and mm. uh, yeah, that that kind of idea. I think uh, I can't doesn't come to mind, but maybe may been listening to a David Tudor album. He said listening to to, to one piece of music really kind of opened his perspective into this idea that you can make your own instruments and and that kind of yeah, opens yeah. this whole kind of uh perspective for him it's uh yeah it's really interesting i think it's uh it's interesting mentioning tudor there uh i mean tudor tudor's very big with me as well and uh um uh, you mentioned in your introduction that I'd I'd sort of uh, toured uh, with. Uh, well, actually, you didn't mention the Rombert, uh, um Dance Company, but uh, with the Rombert, I toured about ten years ago, just over ten years ago, when they uh, revived uh, Merce Cunningham, David Tudor's Rainforest, um, just after Merce Cunningham died. Um, with and it was the with the cooperation of the Cunningham Dance Company and so on. And uh, this was the first um, first time this piece had been um, you know um, publicly shown for many many years. And uh, and myself and Roger Miller, who the was the percussionist um, uh, in the Rombert Orchestra, uh, we were the two musicians, uh, uh, you know, in the role of uh, Gordon Mummer and uh, David Tudor, who uh, you know. Uh, performed uh, in the earlier versions of the in '68, um, and um, and and Tudor's a lot about uh, the way Tudor worked, uh, not just the techniques, uh, the the techniques of of selecting sound sources and playing them through objects, which is obviously a fascinating hybrid material technique, uh, which is really interesting. But the uh, but some of his instructions uh, for that work are really are really interesting. There's a sort of page of um, typewritten, uh, it's not really a score, a series of instructions, and one of um, uh, and 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 the 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 musicians that their, their task is to discover and disclose what it is that their sources and the objects that uh, the sources are resonated through are capable of. To discover and disclose, and to do this in real time uh, uh, with each other, uh, in each other's presence, and that that idea of of, of discovering and disclosing uh, what your um, what what's 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 with you, what what you've brought to the scene, you know what you've you know the the things you've been working on, the the instruments you might have made, the programs you might have written. Um, uh, uh, to bring them such that they are things that you can uh, interrogate uh, and discover and disclose what they're capable of uh, in real time, um, and that that I think that that I think is extremely interesting, and it also it also sets up for me a particular philosophy of making and a particular philosophy of how uh, the things that you make relate to uh, how you how you perform with them and uh, uh and also it and and also it that that phrase also richly contains in some ways a kind of uh you can imagine uh well you can certainly imagine arcs of performance which are not discovery and disclosure you know which are just uh you know doing what you know the stuff does right and just doing it uh and reenacting it and re, re you know and, and uh, uh again uh but uh, but so it sets up a whole philosophy of, of performance as well, and that uh, that that phrase of Tudor's has, has really has really stuck with me. Mm. Yeah, well, we'll we'll certainly be um, delving into this subject of 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 making and instrument design and and, and relationships with objects because I think it's something that, um, especially in the field of people who are going to be using some flucoma technologies, instrument design is something that that goes hand in hand with that kind of stuff. Um, 
for that, I'd like to get uh, perhaps maybe a kind of uh, wider image of, of of some of the things that you do, because uh, your practice is very wide. Um, so you mix musical improvisation that we've talked about with things like film and poetry. Um, I know that you also work a lot with processing for doing uh, image manipulations. Um, I wonder, for example, how you see things like musicking and image manipulation coexisting in your practice. Um, are they even separate practices at all? Um, and perhaps generally, um, are there common themes that uh, run amongst your various practices and, and amongst your various works? Yeah. Now, I, I don't want to get too stuck on, uh, you know, a sort of Cage, Cunningham, Tudor uh, line of thinking here. I, 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 but there is a, there is a, um, uh, a phrase of Merce Cunningham's uh, uh, where he uh, characterized uh, the relationship that uh, he had to uh, John Cage's music and David Tudor's music, uh, which was that... Um, uh, they favoured uh, dance with music, not to music. And I think that's, that's again, another a very compact and significant uh, phrasing. And it gives a kind of idea as well about how you can think of uh, intermedia relations quite generally, um, that, uh, that they can be with each other. Um, and, and in being with each other, um uh things happen things happen and of course again the the sort of uh uh you know cage cunningham uh, uh dogma in some ways was to just have things coexist and have have things and and whatever whatever emerged out of their juxtaposition by happenstance was 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 how it should be and uh uh and that was the and that and when we did um uh, rainforest uh, uh, part of the uh, instructions were uh, not to see the dance in development at all and also not to have line of sight of the dancers when you were performing so we would be you know hidden away somewhere we had no line of sight of the dancers and um, uh, so so nothing about uh, our uh, imaginings about how the music should work with the dance uh uh entered into things um that that was that was bracketed out and actually i see that i i see a lot of the work that i do with certainly with working with um image uh material along similar lines um the processing programs i write and there's a there's some particular ones i've been exploring with exploring many years which work with very slowly moving layered uh animations of, of photography and uh uh and sometimes the subjects of photography are uh uh, are uh a lot of the time that it's textural material uh something with a, a little bit of a painterly abstraction to it anyway uh and sometimes it is indeed paintings uh photographs of paintings images of scans of paintings or something like that uh but laird uh um uh slowly moving lead uh, uh combinations of things and 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 working with layers uh and working with things which um kind of uh, uh change and intertwine in varying tempos that's uh uh that's very commonly how i uh you know put uh my music together as well so there might be a commonality uh of of, of layering of comings and goings, of 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 kinds of uh, uh, interplay, happenstance, uh, but actually, I tend to avoid doing close couplings between media. But well, but certainly with uh, image material, uh, I tend to avoid that. Um, I have done some experiments over the years with very close coupling of things uh, uh, of a of a sort of like slightly. A hypnagogic uh, psychedelic nature but i tend to avoid that sort of thing and prefer a sort of uh, loose slip and slide um uh, the way i work with text um often um uh i will if if the if a particular performance uh is thematized in a particular way uh or interrogates certain sorts of issues i might write uh, a text in relationship to that and so an example of this is uh a, a poem 
a poem, sorry, a performance I did with uh, Owen Green at the Sonorities Festival uh, 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 last year in Belfast, um, uh, which was a, a performance called The Brazen Head. And uh, this refers to a, uh, a story about Roger Bacon um, and a friend of his, uh, a Bishop uh, Bungay, Friar Bungay, um, uh, who were uh, uh, constructing um, through uh, a combination of um, chemistry and uh, healthy doses of necromancy, um, a, a, a brass head. Uh, that would speak and that would uh, uh, answer questions, particularly questions of an urgent political nature. And they 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 get a recipe for how to do this from uh, 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 from um, uh, the Arabs, right? Uh, so it's all tied in with uh, um, the complex relationships that uh, the Crusades and uh, uh, European Christians had with uh, the Arab world, and also. And also at the time, uh, 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 and also somewhat later when there, there was a play written by Robert Green, uh, contemporary of Shakespeare's, uh, about uh, uh, Bungay and uh, uh, and Bacon trying to build this brazen head, and of course then the idea of building a uh, uh, a necromantic head. Uh, was ridiculed as you know uh, showing the evils of a cultish catholicism you know as uh, it, it, during the, the elizabethan time but so so a sort of complex sort of story but also but we read it of course as a as an anticipation of artificial intelligence and of controversy surrounding artificial intelligence so so i i wrote a text uh which uh uh in in a kind of um uh, you know, I say poetic way, I suppose, a sort of poetic prose text, which uh, retold the story of of, of Roger Bacon um, and uh, and his comrades uh, uh, trying to build this head, and and imagined that uh, when, as they do, Bacon and Bungay fall asleep, uh, uh, waiting for the head to come to life, that they dream, and their future dreams are of uh the uh promises and uh dangers of artificial intelligence uh and then the performance uh is then and this this was read as a as a sort of text in, in advance of the performance and the performance itself uh used various uh, uh methods for interpreting uh uh the sound in the room uh and uh um uh and uh featured a uh, a brass well brass brass painted uh plastic mannequin head i had made which was doing binaural listening to things in the room we conducted the whole uh the the performance as a kind of uh summoning of the of the spirit of the brazen head now i've given you a lengthy example there but but so when i work with that's a different kind of issue about intermedia relations than say image working with with uh with sound uh uh there you know the the text and the whole formulation of the of the performance was was uh there was a whole concept there which was worked out in the text mm -hmm. and uh, and that's something i quite commonly do with writing mm -hmm. so uh sorry there's a series of complex relationships uh uh but i uh, there's there's certain similarities there's certain there's a family resemblance between things sometimes uh, but the important thing, the interesting thing to me is to create this heterogeneous sort of assemblage of, uh, of, of, of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, well, it's interesting to hear diff yeah, quite different um, ways of approaching the, the putting together of different art forms from that intermediate kind of approach where, where meanings will, will emerge from juxtaposition of, of things to that very kind of, um, Thought out, significant, uh, fascinating story about the uh, the uh, head necromancy of predicting artificial intelligence. Uh, and a shout out to Owen Green, of course, who was working Absolutely. on the, the Flucoma project. It's, yeah, no, that's great. Um, and perhaps uh, to get maybe more onto the, I quote 
well, you know, um, stress quote marks, uh, musical side of things, uh, obviously a very important aspect of, of your work is going to be improvisation. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously it's a vast field, uh, there's very many different approaches to it. I, I wonder how do you approach uh, improvisation in your practice? And perhaps uh, a good way to, to get into that would be uh, to explain how you configure your setup for an improvisation gig, um, whether it be playing solo or, or with others. Yeah. Um, a lot does depend upon who I'm playing with and, and, and the history that we've developed. Um, if there is, if there, if it has been a long-term relationship. And the way I work, say, for example, I mentioned uh, a duo that I've, you know, had for, you know, over 25 years now with Sten Olof Hellström. Um, and, uh, and we, we, we wanted to, uh, uh, explore a principle of, <clears throat> or sometimes we sometimes sort of like rather, uh, uh, tongue in cheek refer to it as a kind of, uh, Stalinist approach to improvisation that the important thing is, uh, is the collective is, is, uh, is the Soviet, you know, it's the, it's the, it's how, uh, and we are subservient as individuals to that. Now that could mean though, that one of us becomes Stalin for, uh, a, a moment or two, um, or even for an extended passage. Uh, but provided that that's justified in terms of, um, how things will work, work out in terms of the collective production of the sound. So the idea that there's a collectively produced sound that we are sort of like, uh, um, uh, in a, in a sort of anti-humanist way, um, you know, uh, creating, um, we're the, we're the bearers of this, uh, we're the laborers of this, this, this kind of, uh, this kind of idea which gets Stalin and Althusser confused there. But anyway, um, uh, that's, uh, and that, that's kind of a principle that we've worked with. Uh, I mean, in, 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 in more in, in sensible, in, in more, more, uh, direct terms, uh, you know, this can mean that if, well, if one of us gets carried away, that's absolutely fine. They can riff, you know, to their heart's content and that will be okay. You know, provided it sort of, uh, you know, has a role in what emerges out of, out of, uh, the collective production of the sound. And, and this in some ways is, uh, you know, is a response to some other kinds of improvisation strictures, like, um, uh, uh, some, some of the writings of John Stevens, for example, which emphasize, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh producing very minimal sounds in, a, in a collective production uh uh where um you uh are, are very careful to allow enough space for others uh you know where listening is the primary activity and so on and this these these are very important principles too and with other with other ensembles and other uh, collections of individuals i might engage in those too but uh and in fact i often you know use some of john stevens exercises dot piece and click piece uh for uh working with certain um in workshops and with other kinds of uh uh technologies that i work with um so it does it does very 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 much now working solo i've tended to think about things um in terms of having a a sort of different, different, f having a, a reflection on the musical resources I have available to me in terms of the different kinds of interactivity and the different kinds of temporalities that they relate to. So there might at one extreme be something, uh, you know, which requires gesture, energy uh, from me to make happen at all, you know, a bang on a can, a pluck on a string or something like that. There might be something which has that kind of uh, a direct physicality to it, or at least a, a, a version of that, you know, the direct interaction of, uh, of, uh, of, you know, much loved by classic human computer interaction research, those the direct manipulation there, there'll be things of that kind of character. And then there'll be things at the other extreme, which run autonomously and do their stuff. And these could be algorithmic things, or it could just be a prepared recording of some sort, a field recording, something like that. 
And then in between, there are the things which are in between. There are the things where you, where uh, amongst other things, you might supervene over an algorithmic system where you might be able to let things run autonomously, but also interrupt it. Uh, uh, there might be uh, systems where you will kind of parameterize their operation rather than you uh, have a, uh, uh, you know, a, a bang on the can kind of influence. And I often think about things in terms of that three way division. Um, the, you know, the direct things, uh, the things which uh, 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 run autonomously, and the things which have a uh, an intermediate or transitional character between them, um, and and this this, as you can imagine, goes also hand in hand with certain kinds of ways of organising how a performance would unfold. Uh, uh, you know, there, there there might be things which run autonomously that, when you pull the faders down on everything else, will show through again. Uh, and there might be times where you will uh, 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 become animated and there'll be a clear gestural relationship between you and whatever it is you're engaging with. And in some ways, that kind of that those kinds of divisions, those kinds of uh, those kinds of distinctions, rather than take kind of sides on which which is the right way to do things and which is not and which is what you're going. I like to try and bring those things together. And have those different forms of interactivity, those different forms of temporality. Uh, different materialities are often involved as well. I mean, I called it bang on a can. It can actually be a can that you're banging on. Um, uh, those different kinds of materialities, having having those uh, coexist uh, and work together, and 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 uh, or not work together, enter into into tension. And in quite a lot of the 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 work I do, I sort of like. I also try and have a number of resources available to me so uh uh john R richards of um, dirty electronics uh, fame and myself sometimes call this you know a a a, a a table a table full of shit right so there should be a a table full of shit you know lots of different shit that you can and it might be it might be organized and thought of in different ways but there's lots of different stuff there uh, that can be that can be brought into contact uh, uh, with each other. Um, the trio three BP is interesting with uh, Paul Stapleton and uh, Adam Pultz Melby and myself. Um, again, this uh, came into existence in some ways because we had a shared interest in feedback, um, and we we. And so, and we wanted to see if, uh, and initially our work, in fact, it's only recently that we've done face to face gigs. Initially, our work was in, um, online during the pandemic times. And we wanted to see whether we could, uh, produce interesting networked per performances with feedback relationships running between us. Um, and so again, uh, and there, I suppose there's also uh, a bit of a, a kind of collective spirit of, you know, us producing material that enters into this complex feedback environment. But the resources each of us have are very characteristically different. Uh, Adam with his uh, double bass, Paul with his uh, uh, volatile assemblage system, uh, which itself is, you know, a lot of stuff. A lot of shit, and uh, and my stuff with you know synthesizers and God knows what else, bags of pure data and uh, feedback it locally running in my environment as well. So we have characteristically different things, <laughs> but again, it's through feedback that these things come together and uh, interact with each other. Um, so again, that's another way of organizing things. So a long answer to your question. I think uh, I think the 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 different ways I have of working solo, uh, in collaboration with others, um, uh, there 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 are, there, are, there are different ways of organising uh, uh, in different kinds of groups depending upon the individuals involved and our history. Um, and a final example, you mentioned a noise rock band that I play in uh, Tone Sucker. Uh, Typically, our, our modus operandi is to agree a tonality and, uh, and to, um, uh, and a tonality that will provide us with, uh, uh, drones, 
particularly drones or sustained textures, and then play and vary these until we can absolutely bear it no longer. And, uh, and, you know, depending on how things set out, that can be after a few minutes or a few hours, but we can absolutely bear it no longer. And then, and then take the, the frustration, uh, uh, the, the in intolerance of the, of what we've been doing, take that as creating a, a zone of uncertainty out of which a new tonality might emerge and then work with that. And then, uh, and so again, constructing pieces which are based around a kind of toing and froing of our, of our tolerance of our own constraints. That's, uh, that's, uh, another kinds of principle that we, that I work with. And again, that's quite specific to that band. I don't necessarily have that uh, principle with others. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so it's really the, yeah, the relationship with the, with the other human beings is going to be at the basis of how, how you approach the performance. And, but it is also interesting to hear you talk about the, uh, the relationships with the objects and the kind of gestural possibilities that are going to be available from that. And I think there's probably, uh, probably stems from your history in HCI and sort of thinking about um, relationships with with objects and things like that. And I, I do want to get back to talking about um, HCI um, a bit later. Mm -hmm. I think maybe just to to finish off as the sort of broad uh, snapshot of, of, of your work, um, maybe to situate some of the your more recent stuff. Um, so in your 2021 talk at SARC, uh, entitled Ontologies of Displacement, uh, you talked about an archival turn in your practice, um, which I think is particularly interesting when thinking about some of the techniques offered by the Flucoma toolkit. Um, so you also cited Hal Foster, who talked about an artist's desire to connect what cannot be connected. Mm. Um, so I wonder maybe, uh, to round things off, um, if you could talk about, uh, this turn in your practice, um, what was it a turn from and, mm. uh, why do you think it occurred? I think, um, well, uh, just out of camera shot here is, uh, or, uh, is, this is my 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 studio space in in Suffolk, and uh, this uh, and you can't quite uh, see it from the camera view, but there is like you know thirty plus years of shit in here. Um, there's um, uh, quite a valuable, it turns out, synthesizer collection. Um, there's uh, oh, you know, several hundred books. Um, um a uh, bunch of electric guitars um oh there's a a, a resonator irish bazooki which i bought once and actually have never played but uh i will get around to that uh there's just loads of stuff and uh, uh half made projects um uh, nothing there, there's my sense in which something is complete is finished is is made is done f done with is always been problematic for me and uh and i i feel i feel much uh kind of uh more energized by staying proximal to uh materials uh and um um and getting things sort of like finalized boxed up um you know uh productized commodified has never been attractive to me uh, but it does mean that there's a large amount of stuff which exists uh, in this sort of uh, uh, half-baked zone, and um, and that's uh, that's been a source of personal anxiety for many years. Uh, you know, I am a massive hoarder. Um, uh, there's so much stuff here, and I kind of sometimes it depresses me, and sometimes it just fills me with joy. And trying to find a way of navigating my way through this has been quite a personal challenge. Uh, equally, uh, I, I record a lot. Um, uh, and I have so many recordings which have never seen the light of day. Uh, in Well, seen the light of day. Not the right metaphor. I've never been published, never been put before other people particularly. Large amounts of material, large amounts of experimentation. Um, and... Um, so 
one way to try and think about this was to regard this as an archive, as something that uh, wasn't just um, uh, 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 a, a load of shit that was the product of a, a hoarder's diseased mind, but actually was an archive, was actually something that uh, could be revisited, explored, um, rediscovered, reworked with um, uh, again and again. Um, and uh, and that's that was kind of the motivation. The motivation was this trying to get some sort of personal peace with this uh, accumulation of things half done. Um, and and also maybe organized performances uh which uh i mean i'm an improviser so i'm i'm not really on a trajectory particularly to uh you know finalized fixed uh uh productions uh and see if if uh the the archive itself could be worked with improvisationally uh and uh an organized uh so so could become a kind of the primary material of uh, of an improvised performance, and uh, that's um, uh, that really was uh, some of the motivation. Now, the Hal Foster uh, uh, quote is 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 a, a great consolation because it's sort of saying that well, if you are going to do this, and he does he, in his work, he's not particularly got in 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 the early writings that he has on archive. Archive, archivology. It's he's he's not necessarily talking about people in relationship to their personal archives, but but the you will come across the impossibility of the task uh, very early on, right? Uh, you know, and actually ensuring that the task is impossible is, uh, or recognizing and feeling comfortable with it being impossible. Uh, and and so there's no way, for for instance, that I could ever access some kind of uh, authentic memories of work I did 20 years ago that could somehow, you know, sort of like be, uh, um, you know, give a, you know, an authentic account of what was going on. It's impossible. Uh, and, and, and bringing together uh, uh, things across, uh, you know, multiple a span of multiple years across different materials, uh, there's lots of things here which I I actually cannot remember why on earth that's here, right? Or or, or what it was. Um, uh, so it's impossible, and and that impossibility to connect what cannot be connected. Uh, the Foster remark uh, I think is uh, is is a great consolation, um, because if one if if one were to ever into uh, ever enter into personal archival work with the idea that all right i'm going to tell the truth of me then that's just ridiculous that's just ridiculous so i i suppose i suppose in answer to your question it's like it was a turn from certain ways of of thinking about uh, artistic processes as being on a trajectory of commodification you know on a trajectory to to finalized work and a way of uh opening out the process and feeling comfortable uh with um uh a a a, a, a whole personal sort of hoard of of of, of half realized work and and trying to be okay with that that's that's uh that that's uh really what what uh you know led me to this kind of term mm. and it, it's interesting hearing about because i'm working a lot with archives at the moment in some of the work that i'm doing and and in reading up about it sort of uh i read an article by thor magnuson um mm. who, who gave a very good kind of historical mm. um account of of the human tendency to mm. to cast conceptual nets i think as nietzsche said about it um uh over over being and and you know kind of sign the, the problems that can emerge around that and and yeah that that citation of how foster of the desire to connect what cannot be connected is perhaps also kind of bringing into light this kind of human tendency to want to classify and 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 and, and organize things um whereas real life is is something that's particularly messy but uh yeah perhaps uh 
so perhaps that's kind of pointing on the fact that the artist is perhaps recognizing that um but still managing to engage with with various objects in this kind of aesthetic way in this this in, in and this archival way you yeah, know it's 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 a really interesting subject i think and uh, it is and uh i i, I mean there's some um... And, and and there's different practices that different artists have. Um, I mean, I'm talking to you in in the midst of uh, of of the mess, and I quite like it that way. I quite like it that I'm bumping into stuff, treading on stuff. Um, uh, um, Francis Bacon, for example, had um, uh, 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 you know his 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 studio, which has been uh, reconstructed in Dublin now, which I've not visited actually, but I've seen lots of photographs of it. I mean, he 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 worked with uh, l lots of photography um, um, uh, uh, initially in, in 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 formulating some of his ideas, and and he and he and and he had what he called the floor potage, uh, the pottage, the 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 soup, you know, the mixture of things, which was how stuff fell on the floor. And and as as it fell on the floor, and he walked across it and spilt things on it, and so on, it would all get ground up. And so he'd have he'd have photographs taken from uh, you know uh, magazines or, or whatever source or personal photographs, and they'd just get ground up in the floor potage. And uh, and 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 that that and I always like that idea. That idea of again having the having uh, you know the mess of the studio being productive to be being. Uh, um, a, a, a slightly different case, for example, is, is Tacita Dean. Uh, uh, she she has massive archives of things, but but and 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 as far as I understand it, there's a there's a series of interviews uh, with her about this. Um, uh, the, the, once once things coalesce into a project, then that project gets its own special space in her studio, and there's a special spe and, 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 and you know a much more. Um, uh, sparse and concentrated and focused space uh and um and again that's a uh you know an, an, another interesting way of working with the physicality of the studio and uh uh and in relationship to 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 your materials uh but i don't have to share the studio with anyone else uh um uh it you know so uh i'm i'm closer to the francis bacon uh kind of uh uh way of Thing I have, you know, maybe guitar effects pedals rather than um, uh, um, photographs from Newsweek uh, uh, on the floor, but you know. Mm -hmm. No, it is interesting to hear about that. Yeah, you know, the, the kind of tendency, perhaps, perhaps in the West or historically, oh. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, to organise things in terms of projects and you know this very mm -hmm. kind of uh, composer score kind of thing mm, and mm. organize things like that um rather than organizing things in terms of objects or in terms mm, of mm. In terms of the multitude of other ways uh, mm. we, could, we could conceive of things uh, exactly mm. exactly uh there's a uh, an interesting um uh there's an interesting book by a collective of uh of of, of european writers who who actually uh published under the collective pseudonym of r a uh, Tellier atelier studio anyway and uh, a book called design things and again this is a this is a quite a sustained polemic against the idea of the project and uh and i've i've written various things uh uh on this in in different incarnations as well uh uh the idea of preferring to think about things in terms of infrastructure uh you know as 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 resources as sets of material resources uh uh and 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 that that's what we're and some kind of um you know federate federations of materials and uh techniques and uh fragments of things that can be uh, out of which of course maybe a project emerges you know maybe something emerges so so certainly the work i described earlier with um uh owen green has a had a project character right had a project character uh but that that emerged that emerged out of uh you know fragments of concern that he and i had and uh uh you know the fact that i had a rather um tacky uh uh decommissioned uh fashion store mannequin that I, mannequin's head that i'd painted bronze uh that i was familiar with the roger bacon story 
that uh, Owen had a bunch of flucoma algorithms. He wanted to shut shut uh, room sound out, etc., etc., etc. You know, uh, that, out of that that sort of infrastructure, you know, the project emerged. And 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 thinking of infrastructures. Uh, uh, or thinking of things as infrastructures, as resources, uh, is is again a a, a a a a turn of thinking that I'm kind of fond of. Mm. Well, certainly um, one of the premises of the Flucoma project was uh, was to kind of, to to try and propose uh, solutions to to that kind of uh, situation mm. of mm. people having large hundreds of well maybe not hundreds but tens of hard drives full filled with hundreds of of, of fragments of sound and how to approach uh corpora on in different ways um which leads me on to i think well to to perhaps some more focused examples of 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 uh some of your musicking and some of your approaches um notably looking at um how you how you've been using some of the flute coma tools hmm. um I'd like to begin uh, perhaps with a project that uh, you will be or will have by the Later time this week. Stops. Yeah, uh, Naim, uh, Naim and not Nim, uh, 2023. Uh, you're presenting a paper uh, called A Hapless But Entertaining Raw, where you talk about your room feedback system. So we've been skirting around this uh, this subject um, through what we've been talking about. Um, so it's a system for improvised performance um that uh joins a constellation of projects perhaps um around feedback by some other in, uh, musicians that you cite in your paper and notably um thinking specifically of Alice Seldridge and Chris Kaifer's uh, feedback cello which was uh, created in as part of the flucoma project um so i know that uh in the version you you presented at uh, nine uh, flucoma didn't quite make it in but i know also that you're experimenting with bringing some of the tools into it um at the moment um but perhaps just to sort of set the scene uh you could begin by uh explaining how this system works hmm. um the system emerged actually out of uh um the circumstances of COVID-19 lockdown. Um, so I was isolated in, uh, in my studio, which, um, then was in Newcastle. And, uh, um, uh, and I thought I'd make in some ways being isolated in that room, um, the topic, uh, in some way. And, uh, I was, uh, beginning these collaborations with Paul Stapleton and then Adam Pultz Melby, some networked, uh, uh, performance collaborations. Uh, and I thought it was interesting how, uh, their rooms, their environments might communicate with my environment. Uh, um, uh, so look, I'd always been interested in, uh, obviously the work of, um, uh alvin lucier um so famously i'm sitting in a room um and uh nick collins's piece soup uh um where uh, a kind of omnidirectional microphone or an array of them is set up in a room and then uh the amplitude uh of the signal there is used as a uh an envelope follower essentially introduces a phase shift to the the signal from the the microphones and then that's put back out into the room and if things are set up in a nicely critical way you get these slowly uh changing uh feedback tones and also the work uh, uh of Eliane Radig um and her feedback work from the 1960s uh, late 60s early 70s before before she started using the ARP um 2600 synthesizer um very um elegant slow moving pieces with very careful microphone placement and uh to to create um feedback tones um these had always been pieces that had appealed to me and things that i wanted to in engage with and had had in some ways done uh you know work on in the past but i thought i'd make this a concerted and covid19 consistent project um and again i thought i'd rather than go for you know um 
a system which had like one algorithm for treating uh, feedback, you know, the, the, the sound from the room, rather than having just, you know, like in, in Collins, there's this uh, amplitude modulated phase shift. Um, uh, in um, uh, Lucier, there's, uh, although this kind of worked with tape, it's like a continual tape um, delay feedback. Uh, rather than uh, rather than work with a, a single uh, uh, way of processing the room sound, I thought I'd work with multiple in parallel and see how and see what happened there, and make some of those uh, uh, kind of tributes to existing historical work. Um, so uh, in the system, there is a little microcosm of um, uh, of uh, of Nick Collins' piece soup. There's also a microcosm of um, De Scipio's uh, uh, background noise study as well. Other so there's a few pieces uh, uh, historical feedback pieces are are present in my system as in kind of a microcosm, but have a whole array of of, of different ways of of processing the room sound. I also wanted something which was kind of fairly uh, quick to set up and uh, and robust in a certain kind of way. Um, so I mentioned Eliane Radig and her sort of feedback work in the 1960s, 70s, which, is, which in involved very meticulous microphone placement, gain structure, um, marking on the floor where the microphone should be and things like that. And... And Alice Eldridge was telling me a little while ago about a, perform a, a, a feedback setup that she once had, uh, which was completely ruined when uh, the first audience member came in. Um, and, and I wanted something which was sort of like uh, uh, easier to set up just to, for, for in terms of the practical exigencies of being a gigging musician, or at least returning to gigs after lockdown. Um, and really, the system sort of developed in in that way, subject to those sorts of two ideas: the one of having multiple feedback pathways in parallel, and with a, a considerable spectrum morphological variation between them. So you know, some some uh, you know um, create fairly uh, identify and create fairly static tones. Others uh, use various forms of granularization and randomization to to chop things up. Uh, a variety, and um, uh, and 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 uh, have something which was uh, practically robust. Um, I also wanted to explore some sort of interaction ideas where how say uh, how the algorithms were parameterized was itself a performable affair. So it, it wasn't so much that there was, you know, like an optimal way in which the algorithm could be, uh, and that is what you found and that's what you stuck with. But it was, but the, but the, but the algorithms, the parameterization of them was, was it was themselves performable. So there's quite a lot of um, kind of emergent mapping in the in the in the system where the where the mapping functions themselves are are written even in one case uh by performer gesture um uh so the transfer functions between you know say an amplitude measurement uh, in the room and what effect that has on a on a uh, a short delay line uh that mapping function that transfer function between the delay time and the amplitude measurement is itself written uh, by the performer in the real time of the performance. So again, ideas of that sort, and uh, uh, and this this sort of uh, develops a, a sort of a line of thinking as well, which was uh, informed. I think we're probably going to talk a bit about Karen Barad later about her, some of her ideas about intra action, where rather than thinking about classically when we think about inter action, we think about separated elements and how that they they can relate. But actually, see the creation of those elements, or the and 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 that field of relationships as something which is also which is produced uh, rather than rather than given by a kind of fixed design or ontology. So again, quite a bit of the the, the system involves mapping relationships and uh, different kinds of behaviour which are themselves performed. Um, so those that's uh, that's that's uh, that's pretty much it. There's a there's a uh, I say the the way I I often work um, I work without shame 
with a, a, a conventional MIDI controller without shame. Uh, it's quite a nice one, though. It's, uh, I'll show it. It's, uh, it's a uh, Fader Fox, uh, much recommended, much recommended. You know, they cost quite a lot now. Uh, um, component costs, very, uh, very fast, fast moving faders. Good, 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 uh, you know, good fast moving faders and a couple of, couple of knobs and buttons for each one. And, and this is a 12 channel, um, a 12 channel MIDI controller. I was very happy to work with its constraints. Uh, so, uh, it dictated the number of algorithms that I was working with. 12 is enough for anyone. And, uh, um, and also the constraints of having, you know, just two knobs to work, uh, to, to, to work each algorithm. So one which targets a, a significant parameter or a, or a set or maybe a set of correlated significant parameters. And the other one, which is, is kind of a behavior selector knob. So it, it selects how the other one, the other knob, uh, works. Uh, and that's done in various different ways, but, uh, but so, so you, you, you can, you can perform the behavior of the other knob as well as the, uh, and, uh, uh, the amplitude of, uh, of each pathway through it. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's, there's no, no shame in, in using a MIDI controller, I think, you know, it's, it's certainly, <laughs> it certainly goes with the, the kind of portability of the system that you, you were mentioning earlier. Um, yeah. And so you're talking about the, so you've got 12 different algorithms that are kind yeah. of functioning um within within the system uh one of those I'd, I'd like to make a focus on um which will be making use of some of the flucoma um technologies is the dynamic tonality algorithm. yes so you were talking a bit earlier about um it, the exploration of a tonality with tone sucker and stuff, maybe not, not quite the same signification here, but um, I'd love to hear more about this module. I don't know if we can quite call it a module or not, but it's mm -hmm. it's a kind of semi-independent part of, of, of mm -hmm. a system. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I was, I was wondering if uh, you could talk about it a bit because it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting algorithm and describe uh, some process of, of its development. Um, and I'd, Notably, be interested in hearing uh, about the differences in working with something like Sigmund, which is what it uses mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. at the moment, and something like Fluid Pitch or Chroma or Signs, um, which are objects that do similar things. Um, but uh, but you know why why would we would use one rather than the other? So I'm not putting you on trial for using no 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 than a Chroma uh, object. But uh, yeah, I'm really interested in hearing about the development process experimentations with different objects um and perhaps algorithmic flavor yeah such a thing i mean the whole idea of dynamic tonality is uh an interesting an interesting zone of of, of thought so the idea that um uh one can uh um make music organized around a, a tonal system but one which is dynamically changing uh and uh either in response to you know the particularities of the uh the materiality of the of the instrument you're working with uh so you could imagine uh lithophones who which uh have a tonality which derives from the material that you're hitting uh and and what that and and what resonances uh that uh creates uh, so either that kind of dynamics or, or, or where the tonality of something changes during the course of a piece of music. So, uh, in response to things which have happened. And that's, that idea seemed to me to be quite int very interesting to explore in the context of a feedback system, a room feedback system. So, uh, so, so in the system that I, uh, have it as will be described at, at, at nine, um, uh, Sigmund listens uh, for uh, three partials, uh, the three most significant partials um, uh, in the ongoing sound, and then uses the ratios between uh, the, uh, uh, the, the fundamental and the first overtone and the fundamental and the second overtone, or second, first, and second, the other two partials, uses those two ratios uh, to generate a scale. So, uh, so in that scale, there will be, um, uh, you know, the partials that uh, exist 
or you know to the extent that the analysis is working but there'll also be other ones there'll be other ones which might uh you know have the potential to exist and also uh the the one control uh available is to give a little bit of a shift to that whole uh that that whole scale and then this uh this scale is realized as a bunch of uh, of waveguides um which take the room sound and and resonate it um uh and then that's put out again so the um uh the uh the idea here was to see if you could uh you know identify the you know the the the, the tonal behavior of the room introduce uh other potentials for it and then maybe uh in, you know possibly encourage you know jumps to other modes other feedback modes and um uh but it but the idea of, of continually of working with a dynamic tonality so it's in response to what's going ongoingly in the room and uh um uh and that's uh that in as i was just saying in the current system as will be described at nine that's implemented using um uh sigmund in in pure data uh my more recent experiments uh um uh involve a, a kind of new further generation of working with room feedback and and here i've begun to build in flucoma right from the start um and while in the system i'm going to just describe i've just described now we'll be um talking at, at 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 nine predominantly uh the room sound itself is processed and then put back out into the room but what i'm working on now is a kind of complement to that where the room sound exists as a modulating signal rather than the sound that's actually directly put back out into the room it exists as a modulating signal so again, in uh, and following the same kind of design principle, there's a whole bunch of different ways in which the room sound works as a modulator. Uh, you know, as in a ring modulation design, amplitude modulation, for, you know, all 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 forms of synthesis that you can possibly you know think of. Uh, you know, are are good candidates here, where one part which might normally uh, in a, a classic synthesis algorithm be an oscillator is the room. And that's that's the that's the next generation of development, uh, and that's what I'm working on right now. And I've I've done a few performances with uh, the version of the system as it as it kind of currently is, and these two work together then. And so in a the, you know the full the full multi algorithmic room feedback blast will involve the 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 room sound having both of these relationships uh you know with with uh with the system you know both as a as as its primary material and as also as a modulator um so uh and here i've i've been using i've been using uh flucoma from the start so uh for instance um who uh so I, i've been using fluid pitch uh uh in uh to uh, uh identify um um pictures in the room and one technique here is to ha is to particularly exploit and this is this is again in answer to your question about some of the specifics of these uh of these algorithms so so fluid pitch has this uh has this confidence um uh output so uh, pitches when uh, you know are recognized uh, you can set a confidence threshold so that something above or will will be recognized as a pitch and something below will not and and what I do is I is I ramp that confidence so I ramp it say over uh, and I ramp it coming down uh, over say a um, uh, uh, an interval of a few seconds so so we start out with you know requiring a lot of evidence and then and then gradually it gets so it always will find a pitch right it always will find a pitch um but uh, uh, uh but uh, uh the most confident in that particular time interval is then retained uh so um and this uh, and, and is retained with its confidence level so you have an identified pitch with a confidence level. 
Uh, and then this is then uh, um, used to uh, generate a tonality. Now, I've 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 um, uh, I've been also working with you know various so sorts of uh, ratio scales here uh, and using signs to resynthesize um, um, uh, and also resynthesize using a uh, um, uh, an annoyingly small number of sinusoids. So, so again, the idea is that is to is to is to adjust things is, is to is is to produce something which might give the room a bit of a jolt, which might give the room a little bit, but putting back into the room something which is not quite what the room is doing, like a uh, you know a a, a a a a knowing simulacrum of what the room is doing is put back into the room, and and to see what the room would make of this uh you know bastardized version of itself being played back in so again uh, resynthesizing uh uh the the sound of the room uh with 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 a, a, a an annoyingly small number of sinusoids that's uh, that's the the technique here um and this technique and as i say using this 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 specific of the confidence setting the confidence threshold and being able to do that dynamically is something that's very interesting in uh, uh, in, in 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 flucoma fluid pitch. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's one example. I think so. I think going back to again your question about you know using different you know objects, different techniques, uh, it does depend upon the specifics of what each off offer, and and uh, uh, and 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 I think it and. In the case of, uh, and I've just given you an example of about how using one particular way in which fluid pitch has been designed, you know, I've 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 used and taken advantage of, and that's not something which would have been so readily possible using um, Sigmund. Um, hmm. Yeah, no, well, it's it's interesting how how the interface of this tool could be at the genesis of of um, this this branching out into this uh this module that inserts itself into this system so it's something that yeah obviously the the way the 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 objects were designed during the fluco project and the the various um the various uh parameters of the algorithm that were available to be changed but also the various outputs um that was something i mean i wasn't on the development team but mm -hmm. i i observed mm -hmm. that it was something mm -hmm. that was very you know that there was a lot of back and forth between some mm -hmm. of the 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 test users and yeah and, and it's really interesting to see how those small but very significant decisions can be taken by an artist and branch out into the into this system that um that can hold them at its genesis or also be a part of a chain that you know the, the part of the development of, of a system yeah it's 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 really interesting to hear it's also it's also good to have an eye for abuse isn't it i mean like um you know i i, I mean it's not exactly abuse but the idea of having you know like a, a an annoyingly small number of sinusoids to mm. do a synthesis um uh and that uh, uh which i which i have good reasons for doing um and and uh uh and the idea of 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 working with the artificiality of things and working with their imprecision with their or 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 finding boundary conditions where things are um likely to fail or fail interestingly um mm. uh i think those are those are important considerations as well um and uh i think a lot of my work has been motivated in that kind of way um to try and find uh uh extreme conditions alternative uses uh i suppose to try and break stuff in a way but but uh not not entirely just for the hell of it not entirely just for the hell of it mm -hmm. um uh you, you know, but to see whether out of the the tensions between what is expected and and what emerges uh whether those those uh, uh produce things which are more interesting than if you just get you know a perfect realization of your will yeah well that's certainly one thing that i've noticed in in a majority of of people that use these kinds of tools and a majority of artists that use these tools and 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 techniques is that yeah most of the time they're looking to push the algorithm to its limits to to make it 
do things in the wrong way and and to be mm. surprised in some manner that's uh yeah it's certainly something that um comes up a lot and perhaps sort of returns to that kind of um that how foster co- quote of a desire to connect things which cannot be connected the desire to do impossible things and and to, and for that to driving uh, as driving one's creative process um certainly with with these kind of algorithms um, people are often want to be surprised and but also not having complete chaos you know gaining a certain mm. level of control mm. and, and doing mm. things for mm. reasons but uh yeah no, mm. it's, it's something that crops up a lot i think these are these are important things to think about generally in terms of the the sort of technological culture that we're confronted with at the moment um and certainly a lot of the 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 discourses surrounding you know the the large language models uh, um, ai large language models which are which is getting a lot of uh, you know controversial attention at the moment mm. uh, uh you know whether whether the whether the whether people are advocating them apologizing for them or denouncing them uh the, these sorts of zones that uh which actually you know more critically look at what happens when the algorithmic becomes embedded with other things or where the algorithmic rubs up against you know like uh uh whatever else is going on you know th- th- those uh those kinds of concerns and whether whether um surprises can be engendered uh or or whatever else happens when the when when you accept that there could be some friction here and and actually go for it um that 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 tends to be a little bit out of this debate uh mm. the, the the debates you know that are around at the moment tend to well you know does do, do, does you know this uh we speak of ai so generically in these discourses as well you know like um you know when i was a lad ai was a bunch of prologue programs it wasn't any of this artificial neural network not nonsense but anyway <laughs> uh you know and and is it, it you know we we tend to think well does it work as advertised yes no right uh you know will it will it make us all uh you know miserably unemployed yes no you know and 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 there's uh and and in some ways it's it's like um black box status is taken for granted and we just debate the the uh the the, the glory or the misery of the black box um uh, rather than saying exactly what the black box consists of or what happens when the black box is placed in an environment that's anything but a black box um and and those those are where i think some interesting lines of debate can possibly occur as well mm. yeah well it's certainly the kind of next step in 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 these kind of tools that we're going to be talking about i know uh i had jess aslan on the podcast uh the other day who was who's kind of ramping up to to using i'll pronounce the 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 cursed words of chat gbt uh, kind of uh, <laughs> algorithm but yeah looking towards using those kind of cue based things in in her creative work and and i also talked um on podcasts with uh kia leeming and chris mellon who over at birmingham work mm. on um more kind of uh yeah uh algorithms working offline more gener- generative generative stuff um yeah it's 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 i something that um i think people are getting into using more and more in a creative way now um and uh, that goes beyond um it's not quite the same use of of uh, as as we make of things like the flucoma tools because mm-hmm. yeah, we we mm-hmm. give ai and artificial intelligence machine learning these kind this kind of umbrella term but it's obviously many different kinds of things mm-hmm. but yeah no it's it's certainly something that um is going to be very interesting going forward um yeah perhaps just to finish on the the feedback system stuff um i hmm. just want to ask you um question around sort of the modalities of playing with the instrument um so 
Eldridge and Kiefer, who we've been talking about, um, and their aforementioned feedback cello, they described that as a shared instrument, mm, um, mm, really mm. stressing on that the the shared nature of it. Mm, mm. Um, so yeah, it's a feedback system that allows them to come together and perform mm. in a kind of inextricable entanglement. Mm, mm. Um, so considering this, I wonder how you consider your system, especially in the context of playing with others, as mm. you've done with mm, um, mm. Adam Pultz Melby. Um, and what are the connections between material and, and space? So you've, we've been talking about Lucier and mm. his sitting in a room and, mm. and you talked in one of your talks about uh, the way he described it as being able to smooth irregularities with, mm. which his voice may have. Um, yeah, I wonder, because um, I believe Adam's, some of Adam's setup is very feedback-based as well. Yes, it is, yes. In, in the case of a feedback system, and when there are several people, what are the modalities of playing that kind of instrument? Is it is it an instrument? Is it a, is it a, a way of changing the space that you're mm. sitting within? Mm. And how do you mm. kind of consider that? Um, well, I like to think about all of those things being possible, um, and in some ways, uh, and I suppose this is a, if I go back to that. Uh, uh, David Tudor phrase of discover and disclose. Uh, if if something has an instrumental character, then that might be something you would discover and disclose. If something has a uh, a kind of uh, spatially or placially uh, formative or transformative character, then that's something you discover and disclose. Uh, and it might be the case that uh, uh, a performance, especially if one's allowed something durational, uh, could could go through a number of different uh, uh, relations, sets of relations, fields of relationship. And um, and certainly, so for example, you mentioned playing with Adam. Uh, so uh, one of one of my feedback algorithms is a uh, fairly simple short delay. Um, which uh, 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 can produce sort of comb filter style effects, and uh, uh, and the delay time is the uh, is the is the key parameter um, that's uh, that's varied, and that can be varied using a number of different behaviors. Um, and uh, uh, on occasion, if I'm in the same room as Adam. And Adam's playing his bass, his double bass. Uh, that uh, uh, algorithm uncannily sounds like a double bass, and it doesn't need much double bass from Adam or uh, to get it to sound like a double bass, and then it then that sustains in the room, and and and, and, a, and a second or, or a cello if I'm in a different kind of range. But there's there's this, there can be a very curious. Uh, uh, a, a, you know, a relationship there that emerges, and um, and and so sometimes we kind of uh, oddly uh, duet as 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 uh, uh, a string instrument and its simulacrum. Uh, you know, even though that's uh, that and, and and where there's a, a a strange sort of relationship of a of, of sort of mutual stimulation, but it still it still sounds like a kind of kind of two string instruments duetting in a way. And then there are other times when, um, say, another one of the algorithms uh, will um, uh, uh, kind of fix a, uh, it will identify, one of the dynamic tonality algorithms, for example, it will identify a set of uh, tonal relationships in the room and, and it can stick with them and it can get, uh, it can get in there and it will stay with them. And things will modulate and uh, uh, and move in a very different way. And I can and 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 physically, I mean, I might just be completely hands off. You know, the much uh, maligned but beloved by me MIDI controller, will, you know, might not be touched for several minutes. Um, and so the relationships, those relationships uh, uh, are varied and can change. Uh, and that, for me, is also an interesting interesting zone. That that actually uh, it's possible to make systems which 
uh, uh, support a variety of interactional relationships, a, re a variety of different footings that people might take uh, with respect to their instruments, uh, with respect to each other, uh, with respect to the whole environment, and that these the tangles that occur, the entanglements that occur themselves can be uh, very variable. Uh, and that's kind of what I go for. And in fact, in some ways, if, if uh, you know, that's a kind of aesthetic of, I suppose, multiple relationships that, uh, that I favor. Mm. Yeah, no, that is really interesting to hear and kind of brings back again, the, your history in HCI, um, HCI and, uh, yeah, thinking, really thinking about these systems and, and, and perhaps being a, so whereas some artists may be thinking of, may take the instrument somewhat for granted and then think about how it will uh, deploy itself within a certain context you're really taking another step back and, and thinking about how you're going to be engaging with the instrument and, and the multiple different ways that um instrument perhaps not being the right term in like this case then this this system or this configuration mm. of, of, of 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 things yeah mm. and that's really interesting